Okay. Hey, everyone. It is that time again today. Uh, we're starting to really love this 11 o'clock hour, at least 11 o'clock Pacific time. So let's get started. For those who have just signed on, please give us a shout in the Q&A box. Uh, since we have many familiar names and repeat attenders, um, what has been your favorite part of the Connect conference? We would love to hear, so let us know in the Q&A. And while you're doing that, I'm going to take care of the introductions and housekeeping items. My name is Kendall Perry. I'm going to be your host today, so welcome, welcome. For content, we're scheduled for 60 minutes. But we're going to have about 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A at the end. So please feel free to type questions in the Q&A box all throughout the presentation. We encourage your participation, so don't be shy. Um, it will be there. If you have any technical difficulties during the session, you can also seek help in that box. We have a team uh, behind the scenes that are helping out with the, the technology part of it. For recordings, we'll be sending the recording via email today with the CE info, and we'll also be posting the recordings daily in our Facebook group. Um, for CE, our goal is to offer CE credit for all courses. Uh, the evaluation and the quiz will be sent today, and then your CE certificates will be issued within about one to two weeks after that. Um, okay, with that out of the way, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce our presenter, hygienist Patty DeGangi. Um, Patty believes dentistry is no longer just about fixing teeth. Dentistry is oral medicine, and it's time that we get around to truly practicing it that way. Patty's specialty is coding, medically necessary coding. Her efforts have assisted thousands of professionals to code more accurately and efficiently. She teaches the why behind the codes. Patty holds publishing and speaking licenses with the ADA for Current Dental Terminology 2020. She brings news on teledentistry as the co-author of Teledentistry Pathway to Prosperity Critical Choices. And I just have to say, Patty, we've had so many people commenting on your course over the past week and a half. Everyone has been anxiously awaiting today's session, and I'm so excited to have you with us. But before I turn it over, I also want to introduce our, our other guest host that we have on the line. So we also have Dr. Cooch joining us. He's the founder of Carry Free and an internationally recognized speaker. He's published hundreds of papers in dental and medical journals, and we are really lucky to have him as our resident Carrie's risk management expert. So with that, Dr. Cooch, I will let you officially hand it off to Patty. Well, thank you, Kendall. And I have to tell you, everybody, that uh, I'm really enjoying these webinars every day. And for me personally, it's, it's such a privilege because so many of these speakers are people that I know and have known personally and, and, and hold in very, very high regard. And I'm so honored to have them on. And Patty is one of those. I think... Uh, when I think about Patty, I think if you went to Wikipedia and looked up the, the term champion, there would be a picture of Patty there. So uh, you're one of my favorite people. You've changed my mind in terms of dentistry being oral medicine, and I'm very excited to see your presentation. So welcome, Patty. Thank you, Dr. Cooch. Thank you, Kendall. I'm very excited to be here, particularly to talk about teledentistry, whose drum I've been beating for the past couple of years and all of a sudden, everybody wants to hear it. Kind of exciting. It's like the people that are talking about infection protection. All of a sudden, those messages that we've been trying to get people to hear and understand all of a sudden are very popular. Well, you know, one of the things about dentistry, and I've been at it a long time, is we have been in disconnected silos. We are so disconnected as a healthcare system. My company name, I changed from dental codology with study of dental codes to beyond oral health because what we do is truly beyond oral health, everything we touch. Yet the other, other specialists in that arena we don't talk to very well at all. We don't communicate with. And that's one of the many opportunities that we have with teledentistry. We certainly have learned with the COVID crisis how interdependent we all are because we can spread this disease so very, very quickly because we are so connected to one another. Well, I'd like to see us connect in other technological ways too, like we are here. Our traditional modes have been in disrupted, whether it's Airbnb that disrupted the hotel business or Uber that disrupted the taxi business, what I see is teledentistry is going to disrupt 
dentistry and connect the silos in so many ways we haven't even put our heads around. And there's both short-term as well as long-term opportunities. As a matter of fact, I'm a futurist by nature, and I heard, heard this, this phrase this morning, and it, it just encapsulates exactly what I believe where we are right now. The best way to change the future is to create it. And I'm all about creating the future. I'm not going to sit back and wait for somebody else to figure it out for me. I'm going to work on it, created it, and I hope you will with me. Again, our offices are closed. We can't see patients in our traditional ways right now. The whole world is closed. Our restaurants are closed. The bars are closed. Everything's closed, as we well know. And now we're talking about what it's going to take to get the economy back up and geared. But you don't have to wait for that. Probably some of you here have already been seeing or at least called by your patients during this last month that we've all been off. I mean, people are cut off from our sources of dental care, especially when we think our sources of dental care only happen in a dental office and providing service provided by a dentist or a hygienist. That's what that's when I, when I break through here in our time together. And what I think I, 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 we have a duty to do is to keep people out of emergency rooms for an oral health issue that we can handle. The amount of emergency room visits uh, for dental problems or health problems now is a really big number. And we know when somebody goes to an ER, what are they going to get? They're going to get a prescription for pain and they're getting a prescription for an antibiotic. That's the only thing that an e emergency department is equipped to do. What if, though, the emergency department had an interoral camera and they could actually show you as a practitioner what's going on? Couldn't you do a better triage to what my person might need? That's the picture I want to draw for us. When I was writing my book, um, I found this excellent, excellent. I highly recommend that you look up this framework, Unlocking the Door to New Thinking. This was a paper I found, 28 pages, and I'm notorious for reading the first 10 pages of something but never getting to the second half. This one I read from the very beginning to the end. And what it talked about is how we can reframe the future of oral health care by reframing our language as well as reframing our thinking. Now, I'm, I'm a bit of a language person. I, again, I write, wrote a lot of books and write a lot of articles. Language is, is my, my, my trade. And yet, I'm not talking about being politically correct. This isn't about PC. It's about understanding the preciseness of our language. And one of the things that this paper says, as I've quoted there, we need to use our nation resources efficiently and effectively. Our healthcare system has cost just too crazy much. I'm going to give an example from my own life. I have eosinophilic asthma. If you see the picture there, yeah, I've got gray hair too. Yeah, I'm in that highest risk group. Now, there is a, an injection that you can get for that called Facenra. And I've been getting that for the past couple of years. But when I started on Medicare last year, um, I, my, in, my physician's office would no longer give it in their office because they don't deal with Medicare. So I had to go over to the hospital. Well, I got my copayment. I got my copayment bill the other day. And my part was $847 of a $13,900 bill for a single injection. Really? That's nuts. That's crazy. That could wipe somebody out having that kind of, especially because it wasn't, I didn't know that I was going to have that level of copay. The thing is, 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 that, a, that, is that a sensible use of our resources? Because our health care costs us a whole lot in this country. You know, people are just starting to think about, you know, particularly people that have been diagnosed and treated for COVID, what are those bills going to be? Astronomical. I think we know that answer, don't we? thing is, it's time to fast-track teledentistry. We have a, an opportunity now, both short-term and long-term, and ADA is starting and has papers to help. ADA has been busy on this. One of the definitions, one of the things they did is they created this document that, is, that says what is a dental emergency. Now we may all have our various definitions in our offices, but this is very specific and this, this document goes hand in hand with another document I'm going to show you in a second. And that's the COVID coding and billing interim guidance document that ADA has put together.
Now, this one is from April 3rd. This has been, this is my, I think my fourth or fifth version of this. They keep updating it. And I'll tell you a bit more about it. But ADA is helping. I also want to offer some help. Cindy Purdy and I, my co-author, we're offering our book at 50% off during the crisis. We built this book as a workbook, as you can see, Critical Decisions Workbook. And this was certainly long before the COVID crisis. We, we wrote this in 2018. It's still the only book out there that I know of that talks about all the different opportunities with teledentistry. And I'll be honest, these pictures are what I really have, believe has been happening is on the left, that's what people have done. They may have bought it, but they didn't take it apart. Now, on the right side, that's the post-COVID. We're all, oh, no, we've got to learn this. We've got to learn this. And again, it's a, it's a workbook. For example, we set up a section that asks you questions. It's like, you know, you've probably seen those kind of magazines or on Facebook where it's like, you know, answer these four questions, and if you answer this way, go here. If you answer this way, go here. We designed the book that way in order to help guide people in trying to figure out where is their teledentistry picture? How is it going to be a pathway to prosperity for them? Now, as, I, as it was said in my introduction, I have become a coding queen. Really? I'm a dental hygienist. I went to hygiene school a lot of years ago because they said there wasn't much math. I don't know how I got something in all, all numbers. Actually, I do know. Because over the years of my speaking as well as as a clinician, I've internalized three important beliefs. One is that we can have a world with no oral cancer, and it is Oral Cancer Awareness Month here in April. I have internalized that belief. We can have that world with no oral cancer. We've got to visualize it. We can also have a caries-free world. I'm talking about really internalizing what that means. If all we think we're ever going to do is manage disease, all we're going to ever do is manage disease. I also believe that we can cure not just manage periodontal disease. Those three important beliefs are the underlying philosophies of my work. The way I got into coding is because we also need to have important metrics to measure it as well as being compensated. So I, and I live in the Chicago area, so I show up every year for the past, I think, 12 years to the code, code maintenance committee. And I'm going to give you a little preview of some things that were decided just three weeks ago. Anyway, I showed up year after year, and I was recognized, and in 2017 and 2018, ADA asked me to write a chapter in their uh, code, uh, CDT coding companion. In order to do coding properly, you have to have a minimum of two books. One is the CDT book, which is the official codes. Then there is the CDT companion, which is how to use those codes and with application exercises, as well as ICD-10 medical coding. I'm going to go there, too in our course here today about how that's the direction we need to move. But I carry, I carry two licenses with ADA. I carry a speaking and seminar license as well as a um, publishing license. And the reason I point that out is you're not going to see references very much on my slides. You will see some little words on the bottom that are when there is a code because I'm required to do that. Let me go back to the little words on the bottom. Just because people put little words on the bottom of slides doesn't mean that it's scientifically accurate. What it means is they know how to use a little font. I want us to be, we need to be more discerning in what we listen to and how we listen to. One of the things and one of the reasons I was thrilled and honored to be part of this conference is because I know there's nothing but the best and the most scientific presentations that are being done here. Again, I'm honored to be here and to speak to you. So what we're going to look at in our time is we're going to talk about how teledentistry is an opportunity, how you can connect in multiple settings, looking at some new expanded accurate coding, as well as a little bit about those pathway exercises that I've already mentioned. I do work with a variety of companies that support the work that I do. Of course, Carry Free is one of them. Thank you, Carry Free, as well as Mouthwatch. Mouthwatch is one of the teledentistry ready companies. They're all over the place, but they've been at it for a few longer than a lot of others. And then my other sponsors that I always honor them and need by do my disclosure on a consultant with many of them, as well as on many editorial boards and blah, 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 blah. I've been around a long time. Anyway. <laughs> Here's what you need to know. Your I bet you there's a whole bunch of clinicians. I know there are because I see some of the names that I know here. Here's the reason why you as a clinician need to learn CDT codes. 
One of the things I know is you never had it in your dental background, and you know, in education, you never had it in dental, in, in dental hygiene school. But here's three reasons you need to know. One is for third-party reimbursement. That's what we often think is the only reason we need to learn it. But here's the question I ask whenever I talk about third-party reimbursement. Is first of all, it's not insurance. We have no dental insurance. We only have third-party reimbursement. That's an important clarification to start with. The second thing is, is, if anybody on here is independently wealthy, I'd like you to write it in the chat box and put it in your email because I want to be your friend. Why do I say it that way? What I'm talking about is that people that have third-party reimbursement as, as part of their compensation package from their employ, employment, if they have employment still, okay? What, the, what I mean by that is, like my, my husband for many years as, a, as an educator, had a, we had a $1,500 policy with Delta. <laughs> anyway, enough said there. But the thing is, when it really hit me, it's like we had that $1,500 benefit instead of having $1,500 in my pocket. Why would I not want to optimize that? I don't need an attitude from an author that says, we don't deal with insurance. Well, guess what? That's my benefit. I want to get it. Just the same as if I was going down to Kohl's to get a coach purse, which is kind of an oxymoron because I don't think that uh, Kohl's sells too many $500 purses. But if they did, and I had, a, I had my Kohl's bucks at home, I would go back to home. I'd go back home to get my Kohl's bucks, wouldn't I? Just as all of you would probably. Because if I have a discount, why would I not want to use it? That languaging about benefits is important. Think of them and explain it to your to, If you end up talking about them at all, you can explain this Kohl's bucks. So what's the good thing about Kohl's bucks? They expire. They have a lot of little language on the back side of the Kohl's bucks that are limitations. That's what, what our third-party benefits are very analogous to. That's one of the reasons. But even if you do have an office that's a 100% fee, fee for service, you have another reason why you need to understand and know it's how CDT works, HIPAA said, CDT is the standard code set for electronic health records. That means we're required to use accurate coding in our electronic health records. The third one, though, is the one that's most important, especially when we're talking about any kind of research, is they provide important metrics. Important metrics. The way, the only way things are counted in our profession is through the metrics that are provided through coding, and right now the only people that have that data are the third-party carriers. But the third-party carriers also create policies around that data depending on how we use the codes. An example is, for many years, many people use, many offices use antibacterial irrigation as part of their periodontal protocol. Okay, we didn't have a specific code for antibacterial irrigation for a long time. But what happened is there's always a code because there's the 999 codes. In all the 12 sections of the book, there's a 4999, 299, and what those are is unspecified procedure by report. So for irrigation, it was the 4999 unspecified perio procedure by report. By report means it requires a narrative. Not a big extra letter that's pre-printed that somebody gave you in a course, I'll show you later, about the medical necessity. But the, the point is that it needed a narrative. And what happened is in 2013, the National Association of Dental Plans, which is a collaborate of a bunch of dental plans have a, that has a seat on the coding committee, submitted for a code. And they, they wanted an irrigation code. And part of their reasoning was that it had been submitted over 500,000 times in 2012 alone. The point of that story is how we code affects the future of coding. Our behavior affects the future. Again, the best way to change the future is to create it. So moving forward. Codes can help our pathway to prosperity, and there's lots of different pathways that you can take. The way I got involved in writing the book is the year, one of the years that I wrote the CDT Companion was the year that these two teledentistry codes came into the, were voted in and approved. There's two codes that we have for teledentistry. One is for a synchronous real-time encounter, and two is for an asynchronous. What we're doing here is a synchronous live real-time encounter. Be more live if you could see me and I could see you. 
Asynchronous is where it's recorded and stored and could be forwarded. It is, those are two codes because those are two of the four different ways that we can connect up through teledentistry. I'm going to give you a little bit of a peek at my book because we've divided, I put it into chapters and the chapters all have very specific reasons that we put them there. And one of those that I wanted to want to show you is that we have in this chapter questions to ask a potential teledentistry vendor. Because you're, I'm sure you're probably getting all kinds of stuff on teledentistry. Oh, do our system, do our system. Oh, you know, we're the, we're the manufacturer. Da, da, da. Yeah, okay. There's questions you need to consider, and part of it is how you're going to use it. Also, equipment. What equipment might you need? It really depends on how you choose to use teledentistry. And then I did an entire chapter on codes. It's not just on codes. It's about innovative thinking around teledentistry. Or let me be blunt in how I'm going to say this. If all we're going to do is go out and do more propies and fluorides, then don't bother. Propies and fluorides have gotten us about as far as we can when it comes to prevention. It's time for new thinking. Do I talk about camera, carries risk assessment, and all kinds of things in there? Oh, I sure do. I sure do because it's about, they, about moving the model closer to those things that I've said of having world with no oral cancer, cure not just managed periodontal disease, and a carry-free carry -free world. Thing is, is it's not more of the same. When we talk about the carries balance and the whole camera philosophy, we can help make it happen with teledentistry. Now, this coding guide, let me give you some, some clues. I have a, there's a handout that you'll be getting when you get the link to the video. And in there I have the, the direct, you can just click on it and go over and download this, this handout. It's, I think it's up to, I think it's 14 pages now. One of the things I want to point out is the coding scenarios that are in there, as well as some informed consent. But down here they have what is now become what ADA is doing with codes. We've been about, the codes have been evolving in addition to the um, the teledentistry codes, we also have a code for HbA1c chair side testing as well as a, a chair side blood, gl blood glucose testing. The first of these guides that, that they create these guides, this is what they look like from the, this is the guide for the um, four, three, four, for the teledentistry codes. The first of these guides they did was for the 4346, the, the gingival inflammation code. We've known for a long time that there's a big gap between prophylaxis and periodontal therapy, yet we, once we had the code, we didn't really know what to do with it. I actually wrote a book on the gingivitis code, because again, it's a game changer too. But this is the guide that they wrote for, um, tele, that ADA wrote for teledentistry. And again, it's, you link with that one through this paper. So it's like link, link on all kinds of great information that you can access. I had a part in writing the, this, this document because I wrote the chapter and they took part of my chapter and put it into this guide. You'll see a specific case that I used in it in a little while. What I want you to understand though, and I need to make a caveat anytime I talk about this coding and billing guide. The reason is that ADA has done some great work that can be helpful and it's on to the, the major third party, third party carriers and ask are they going to cover certain things under this teledentistry set, this setting? Because one of the things that's happened is HIPAA has relaxed their national guidelines on whether we can, what we can do under the personal health information and stuff like that under, in this COVID crisis. And this is ADA's attempt to give you some information with that of what, what codes might be covered. Here's the concern I have. Just as the HIPAA is national, and there's, there's a relaxation of the HIPAA for, from a national po point of view, there might not be in your particular state, okay? It might not have been relaxed in your particular state. Same thing here. It might say the Blue Cross Blue Shield nationally or Delta nationally has, will, maybe will cover the teledentistry codes or the, or the problem focus codes, et cetera, et cetera. That doesn't mean it's going to guarantee you coverage. See, I never talk coverage. You know, I don't talk coverage because coverage is a policy decision. There could be four, three or four of us, and I bet there are at least three or four of us that have state farm car insurance. Can I tell you if, and if all of us got to be in a car accident, if somebody's bumper's covered? No, unless I have their policy in my hand, I can't. 
That's why as clinicians, we should never be talking coverage. Leave it to the professionals, the, the, our business professionals that have that information, if they even have it. And you say, oh, well, it's in our fee schedule. You know what? A fee schedule is good for about the three and a half minutes after it's put in. Got to quit talking coverage. That's not the important role that we hold as the providers of the care, particularly as clinicians. Telehealth will be paid better by medical, period. In another exciting conference that I'm um, involved in, that I was asked to be part of, um, Dr. Lou Graham and his university professionals group here in Chicago, are they've gotten really into this whole medical billing world, and we are doing a four, um, for session two-day seminar. I know you also heard from Kendra Sellers on this series. She's a good friend of mine. She's excellent at medical billing. Medical billing is a different game. And I've always said we got to learn how to do dental before we get into medical. Although that world's changing, and I have a feeling dental coding is going to go away. I'll give that opinion later. Question is, is when you look at this, this image, are you looking at the teeth, hygienists, are you looking at the calculus, are you looking at the bone loss, doctors, are you looking at the, the places and thinking implants, are you planning a case? The first question you should be asking, asking yourself, is this dental or medical? It's medical because dentistry is a specialty of medicine. Mayo Clinic, um, Dr. Charlie Mayo, one of the, the Mayo brothers that started Mayo Clinic, addressed the ADA back in 1928. And what Dr. Mayo said was that dentistry is a special branch of medicine, as is ophthalmology. It may be going too far to say all dentists know everything about medicine and all medical doctors need to know everything about dentistry, but we need to work better because the mouth is part of the body. Question is, how are we doing? 1928. That's almost 100 years ago. And we're not doing very well at that. We really aren't. But here's another part why this is so important, because dentists have been defined as medical physicians. Back in 2013, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid redefined what it is to be a physician. The definition of a physician is a doc, includes a doctor of dental surgery and of dental medicine. That happened in 2013. Hygienists were saying here, the federal government redefined what it is to be a hygienist. A hygienist used to be a technology or technician. We're now in the same category as dentists, as diagnosing and providing of treatment. These definitions make a difference when we talk about what creates a standard of care. What definitions go into it? I gave you two pieces already. I gave you, well, I gave you several, actually. I gave you the, the idea that the ADA has set some things, the federal government sent some things. The CDT is actually part, I could argue that it's part of the standard of care. The thing is the standard of care is not the highest level to which we, we try to attain. It's the lowest level to which we go no lower. As a dentist, you as a dentist have a, are required to make a diagnosis. Now, I know that sounds like, whoa, yeah, yeah, we do. We think of our diagnosis as a dental diagnosis, but there really is no such thing as a dental diagnosis. It's only a medical diagnosis. You're an oral physician. You've got to make that medical diagnosis. The staff can't do it for you. The billing service can't do it for you. And that medical diagnosis equals medically necessary treatment, medically necessary coding, which will, can help optimize reimbursement if it's available in dental coding as well as medical coding. This isn't an equation just for medical coding. This is for dental coding also. If you don't have a medical necessity established, no claim is going to get paid in medical. That's the way it needs to be in dental. What's our reason for doing what we're doing? The basis of medical necessity is SOAP. Many of us have learned, learned this format, but boy, this is a great time for you to start learning to implement it in your practices that we're routinely going to be using a SOAP format for our documentation whether it's in person or whether it's teledentistry. SOAP and medical necessity starts on the phone call. Not when they arrive at our office, but on the phone call in our first contact. S is for what their problem is, then there's the O, which is their information we, we gather about them, the data, the vital signs, et cetera, et cetera. A is including the diagnosis and P is the procedure. Dentistry, we kind of do O and A, we skip right over P, S, and A in my experience. We don't diagnose, we just do stuff. I get more questions about, Patty, hey, 
we did da 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 da. I go, what's the diagnosis? And they'll say, alien airplane, a crown, endo. Those aren't diagnosis, those are treatment codes, not treatment thinking. That doesn't mean that we haven't made a diagnosis, but when it comes down to any kind of record keeping, you didn't write it, you didn't do it. So you got to write it down. A healthcare practitioner, as a healthcare practitioner specialty, you can have things covered by medical. Again, I know Kandra covered this, but this is really important for the thinking and the opportunity that you have with time right now to start really doing this. This is the claim form, a dental claim form, that was, goes with the case that I wrote in the CDT companion as well as in, the, in my book. This is Jane Smith. Now, here's the story. A, the hygienist goes to a senior home, not a, not a nursing home, but a senior home, and they do a screening. And in that screening, they, she screens 50 patients, and it ends up because an awful lot of people, as they retire, they retire out of their dental benefits. They no longer come to see us. She finds 10 patients that end up coming to brick-and-mortar practice. That's one of the ways teledentistry works. But what also happened is Jane Smith is living at this senior home. She and her husband are patients of record in your practice for many years. They've decided to move to retirement home, even though Jim is still working at a local community college and still has dental benefits. Jane, unfortunately, fell and hurt her ankle, and she can't get to your office. So she is. what happens is she is seen synchronously by the hygienist hooking up with an inner camera in the, in the senior home to your office, and you can look directly into her mouth, into Jane's mouth, and you know Jane's mouth because you have, you have a history with her, and you can make a diagnosis and order some treatment. So let's look at this. First of all, you can see a whole bunch of things were charged out there, but let's, let's first look at a couple of places that I have arrows. And first is there's the teledentistry, synchronous real-time encounter, there's the code. That's not the only thing, though, that needs to be done. When you're doing a claim form for teledentistry, the location, there's, there's different parts, and I have this in the book, different parts of the claim form that you have to fill out differently. Because usually the provider address and the address of service is the same. Okay, in teledentistry, it might not be. There's also a different number, and that's a federal number that identifies the location of where the treatment was rendered. So that's one of the things you can see on the claim form there. Another part of the claim form I want to point out is here is at broken ankle, high blood pressure medication, thermal sensitivity, active caries. There is the diagnosis of medical necessity there to support the claim. I want you to look at how small that box is. That's the box remarks. In my opinion, a claim should never leave any office without something written in that box because that box is for anything that supports the treatment that you're rendering, the why behind the treatment. One of the boxes I can't point out, and that is the diagnosis, the ICD medical diagnosis codes that we can and already should be using to, to enhance our dental claims. In the CDT companion book, in all of the chapters, part of the thing that we write is some suggested codes. There's a document that I, I can send you if you want that has all of the ICD codes, me, medical codes, mapped on dental at this point. This is a whole different thing, though, than really thinking what medical necessity and doing medical coding. Because in ICD, there's actually 72,000 terms. In CDT, there's 906. In the preventive section, there's only 25. And of that, 15 of them are for space maintainers. There's only 10 preventive codes in all of ICD. Medical coding is a completely different game. Again, this comes from this companion. What you put in, you put it in box 35 when the information may affect how the claim is paid, when the procedures minimize the risk associated with the patient's oral or systemic health. What are we doing that doesn't have something to do with their oral or systemic health? Nothing. That's why I created this idea of a Twitter-style dental medical necessity, okay? Part of it's based on the size. Let me go back to that size of that box so you can see. You don't have a lot to write there. One of the things that Twitter has done is taught us, well, it has the potential to teach us how to be more concise writers. Again, as an author, 
the best editing is you go back and take extra words out. Most of us write like we talk, which is lots of words. I used to think writing more was better. So I had these massive things that I was writing down in my, my chart, whether it was paper or I mean it was paper and I was writing it or when I, we went to electronic health records. Which by the way, this idea of, of electronic health records, I worked with a practice where we were paperless and chartless in nineteen ninety two. So if you're still kind of lagging behind on that, you really got to get into the what we've been doing for a real long time, and a lot of this has been tested by many people by this point. Anyway, I thought more was better, but if it's not searchable, if it's not legible, and if it's not read, because that's the other part. I was very impressed. My husband, a couple, a couple years back, was diagnosed with bilateral kidney cancer and had bilateral partial nephrectomies. And you know why that was done that way? Because we had a practitioner that we went to for a second opinion that started with, we brought in a ton of records, because by that point we'd been through all kinds of things on diagnostics. But he came in and he said, well actually he was, he was a friend of my brother-in-law who's a physician, but he came in and said, hey, we met at the wedding 29 years ago, you remember? No, none of us remember. But he said to me, he looked at us and he said, before we talk, I want to read. And I watched that man read every single page of every single record we brought in. How often is that done? See, it's only valuable to the point that it's legible, readable, and we actually take the time to read it and put together the clues of what's going on for a particular patient. This is a Twitter-style dental medical necessity that I wrote that supports the, someone having a gingival inflammation. Sinus issues, GERD, possible pregnancy, high-risk caries with a carry screen score of 24, 59, thermal sensitivity, 45% type 2, type 3 inflammation. With a diagnosis, all of those, you, I've got risk assessment, I've got symptoms, and I've got, here's the diagnosis, gingivitis, dental biofilm induced mediated by systemic local risk factors. That's 208 characters. Are you seeing this patient? Are you seeing the amount of risk this patient has? The circumstances that she's presenting with? Here's the background of this patient. This patient is a patient of record who is, who is, had been only been your patient their, her entire life. As a matter of fact, she's been seeing the same hygienist in your office her entire life. And she goes away to college at the age of 20, and her life changes a bit. Because why? She's making her own choices. She comes back in at nine months instead of the regular six months, even though we have no science behind six months. But she comes back at nine months, and she, first of all, she says, oh my gosh, college is so hard. I, you know, there's so many things going on. Her circumstances have significantly changed in the nine months. What would we do with her? Would we go into her automatic behavior of she's due for appropriate, she's due for x-ray, she's due? Nobody's due for anything. We need to make a diagnosis and assess what's going on for her. And again, she's got a high carries risk here, especially with that score of 24.59. By the way, I do that do a carry screen score in my classes. I love when a high gets 24.59, they lose their stuff. <laughs> but of course, it's a very, what I love about carry screen score is it takes our words medium, moderate, and puts it into a numeric score, which is so much more valuable in my book. It really, really is. Because when I treat somebody that's got a high score like that, same as I would with somebody that's got a 12 score, no, I treat, do differently. I love this, the declining role of the dental drill. Matter of fact, let me give you a number. Delta Dental did a retrospective study of their database. And what they found is that when a burr touches the tooth of a 10-year-old, the first time we have a single burr to that tooth, between the age of 10 and 72, on average, we put a cost $2,160 per tooth. We say it again. Between the age of 10 and 72, it costs $2,160 per tooth. Why? Because as soon as we touch them with the drill, we put them in a cycle of repair, the re-repair, the re-repair, the re-repair. Or I tell a story of my niece. I have a niece that is 29 now. And she got married four years ago, and we were, I get really emotional on this one because we were really excited that she was able to get, get um, 
married because when she was 15, she ended up with a pH biofilm disease that ate away part of her body, a flesh-eating kind of a disease. It got so bad that my sister, and this is my baby sister, and this is my youngest niece, had to be taken to that specialist. And that specialist said the only options that we had were amputation. And so they amputated. But they said the history of this kind of disease, it keeps coming back and coming back. And even after we build a false part on it, it keeps coming back. She had two occlusal fillings. That's the reality. That's what we can change. Now is a great time to implement this. Remineralization, arresting medicaments, sealing, and counseling, because that's a valuable service. I know Carrie Ibbotson is here, and she was also one of your speakers. You talk about somebody that's taken this to an art. Congratulations, Carrie, and the model that Carrie is moving us all toward. This is where our opportunity is with teledentistry. Now, some of the more recent information with COVID is that smokers and vapors might be at higher risk for COVID. Again, what's the definitive research on that? Well, they're sucking that in their lungs. Here's the thing that happened is that my, I have a very active group. And we looked at this, and it's like, you know what? Tobacco counseling is not accurate for vaping. Because if you read that code, Tobacco Counseling for the Control and Prevention of Oral Disease, in order to get a code right, you have, to, you have to read the not just the name of the code, you have to have the description of the code. You need the general description of the section. Most of us know our coding just from whatever our, whatever our computers say, which all you have is the name of the code. But co vaping would not qualify under this code. So that's when it's like, okay, let's be proactive here. I'm not going to wait for the future. I'm going to create the future. So let me give you a preview of CDT changes for, 20, for 2021. These, this was, there was work that's done by Beyond Oral Health Group. We have a movement to change the future of health care, not the future of oral health care, but the future of health care. I've got two partners with Lindsay, myself, and the other Patty, two Patties. Anyway, what we did is we put together our Dental Codology Consortium, and we've been showing up the codes meeting because anybody can submit a code. You can go on your phone right now, go ADA, CDT, and there's a form there for you to submit a code. Now, you have to get the paperwork right and all that stuff, but if they, you do the paperwork right, the coding committee is required to hear it. My group submitted for 12 changes in addition to the codes this year. We showed up down at ADA. That was the last live meeting, live in-person in -person meeting I was at. It was on March 12th. I was down at the ADA headquarters. And this is the, the counseling code for vaping, opioids, et cetera. And it was passed by the consul. It was passed by the code committee as we wrote it, which is very unusual in itself. They usually like to do word my street. So we will have a code for that for next year. We also had... We also believe that we should have a code to have a metric on how we're doing head and neck oral cancer evaluations. But if you look in the second paragraph of this very lengthy description of a comprehensive oral evaluation, it says includes evaluation for oral cancer where indicated. What does that mean? It means if we feel like it, well, we got that language struck. So that was another victory that we had. So an oral cancer evaluation is part of every comprehensive oral evaluation and every periodic oral cancer evaluation. Why do I say that? Because the periodic evaluation said that you're checking for any changes that have happened since the last comprehensive or periodic evaluation. In other words, you've got to check all the same stuff. And if you didn't write it, you didn't do it. This actually drives us into doing a better model of dentistry if we actually followed what it said. But let me give you a case. This is Dominic. I talked a little bit about the case that I wrote the, the Twitter style, but let me give you a specific case on Dominic. As compared to the person I told you about before who's named Kelly, actually, this is Dominic. He's a six-year-old. He was school, screened in a school-based program. He lives in a low socioeconomic community. He's a, his, Mom is eligible for CHIP state funding. He is, doesn't have an office of, he doesn't have a dental home. Kelly had a dental home. Dominic does not have a dental home. When you look at his mouth briefly, you see that there's heavy plaque tissue bleeding, white spots lesions with heavy level of active caries, one restoration in the past. He's also had a lot of ear infections. But let me tell you his story. His mom 
got pregnant when she was in high school. She dropped out of school to have to raise her son. She works two full-time jobs that she has no benefits. She has no kind of health benefits from either one. And she lives in a food desert and has no place to buy food except a dollar store. Dominic is on his own a lot, as well as with a variety of caregivers, and so he has a lot of unsupervised dietary habits. I'm going to throw something in here just a little aside before I talk more about Dominic. There was a fantastic PBS special on our diabetes epidemic. I just saw it last night for the first time. Look for it on your local PBS station. The numbers are unbelievable. And again, we in dentistry, there, again, there's two codes that we have for looking at someone's glycemic control through an HbA1c level and a glucose level. What's interesting about those two codes, we had the HbA1c code come in in 2017. And part of the research behind the reason that, that we got a code for that is because it's at such ep epidemic proportions that that dentistry, that there's some research that says that if dentistry gets involved, we can make a difference. But the same people that brought that code the one year came back the next year that says, we need a code for a glucose test chair side because before we do any invasive procedures, we need to know what their glycemic control is at that point in time. Now, if we look at this, this case here, Dominic is already on his way to diabetes. He's already on his way to obesity. He's already on his way to heart disease. His ear infections, just that alone, that risk factor alone, means that he is at, he, with any ear infection within the first 18 months of life, means that he is at high risk for early childhood caries. Infections, as we see, and it isn't the stuff on the, the lower right that I want you to look at that puts him at a high risk, it's at one restoration. One restoration, three years equals high risk. How many high risk patients do we have? This is Kim's, this is why I'm involved with Carry Free, because this is where we've got to do this better. It's not going to be just brush your teeth, fluoride, and fluoride, and here's a piece of string. And we've got to have something more definitive than that to help as his mom. So here's the thing, though, is we're talking teledentistry here. You saw Dominic in your office. You already have that. You already know what's going on with Dominic. Now Dominic calls your, mom, your office now because Dominic is in pain. What do you have to offer? We'll see you in two months, three months, whenever we can get back in. We don't know. Well, Dr. Paul Glassman at University of California, well, he's California. He is the father of teledentistry. Just as I look at, uh, uh, we have the fathers of the Canberra movement. This is the father of teledentistry, is Paul Glassman. And this is a really kind of complex, when you first look at it, flow chart for when you have patients that you want, or patients both new and patients of record that you might want to see in a teledentistry encounter. A system that you might want to select is going to help you support you all the way through the whole encounter, okay? That's important to understand. You've got to look at what set, do you want an optimized system or do you want to combine a bunch of available tools? You can combine available tools right now. You can use text and, and patient-generated gra uh, graphics. You could possibly even use a FaceTime and all that. But here's the part that it's going to take is this is a – I look at that combining. I look at that as cobbled, cobbled together system. thing is, is it's going to be able to do what you need it to do. Where it's an optimized system, a teledentistry integrated system that integrates with your practice management software as well as your other parts of your practice Again, just by using the word optimized, I think that you can tell where I lean on that one. Yeah, what, is, what kind of optimized tools do we want to select that will serve us for now and in the future? That's the way, one of the things to consider, which is why in our book we put how to select a teledentistry vendor. This is only one page. We have multiple pages on it for you to think through because one of the things is that I want to know is because, again, there are definitely some Johnny-come-latelys recently. I want to know what kind of experience that, that, that they've had in other deployments. I want to know if they have some references from existing customers. How are they going to handle the data security and patient privacy? They all say, they're, oh, yeah, we're HIPAA, we're ready, we're HIPAA. Yeah, okay. If there's a HIPAA violation, it's not that vendor that's going to be called on the carpet. It's going to be you as the practitioner. 
What other additional features do they see on the, on the horizon? How forward thinking are they? Are they helping you build for the yesterday, for the now, or for the future? I, I lean toward the future. What kind of warranty? What kind of customer support? One of the things that needs to be thought through in your practice, particularly if we're talking about the longer term here, is say you have a, a group of hygienists or other people in, from your practice that are no, going to go out and see people remotely because there's so much need out there. And how are they going to connect to your office? Are you going to do it synchronously, a live connection? Or are you going to do it asynchronously? If you're going to do it synchronously, how are you going to schedule that? But every hygienist here, <laughs> think about this question. How long have you waited for doctor, the doctor to come and do your evaluation now? I think I'm up to two, three years that I've waited for a doctor to come and do my evaluation. <laughs> the thing is, is that we need to think through that whole process now. See, with the 4346 code even, you can't have the doctor coming at the end. That's our clinical tradition. That can't happen that way anymore. That's a whole other course. But the point is that it's time for us to think through things that weren't working for us. So if we have a teledentistry, who is going to take that synchronous connection? What are you going to do if there's a connection problem or issue? One of the things that even happened with this call is I have a really nice microphone headset that we couldn't get to work with this platform. There's some reality on how technology works. That's the reality. So you need to think through all those with the teledentistry vendor, how they, how they answer that question on how they can support you and how you ask the questions. Because these are questions you haven't asked before because this is a whole different, different game. The thing is, is that Mouthwatch is one of the companies, and one of the doctors, I'm on an advisory board for them, and one of the doctors himself put together how also, if you're in a teledentistry setting now, where there isn't a camera involved, how is it that you would instruct the patient so you can see everything? And what Dr. Scott Howe did is he used his own mouth, and he went through, this is, and this is a, how you instruct your patient to show you. How you could, so you can see everything to make that triage decision that you need to make. And he does multiple, multiple steps of it. And there's even Dr. Howell. <laughs> he said, I wish I had somebody else to do this on, but all he had was himself at this point. Anyway, you can download that at the Mouthwatch website. That's one of the things I recommend that you go see. But it's, these are many, many different parts that you need to think through. Then there's the legal part of state practice acts and how that works. How does it work in your state? Because I know people from all over the country here. How is it going to work in your state with supervision, with you have crossing, crossing a state line? The way it has been is that a dentist can only perform a teledentistry encounter with, some, with somebody that's in the state where you are licensed. Some of that's evolving right now. Some of that is being bent right now. It'll be interesting to see when we go back to normal, whatever that is, although I don't think we're ever going back to whatever we did before. But with our new normal, how is it going to work with that? I don't know, and I don't know, and nobody knows those answers. But there are definitely people that are asking the questions. So then you decide, based on your triage with, with Dominic and his mom, that you need to bring him into your office. Okay, You can set that all up with all the notifications, all the signatures, beforehand, again, through the teledentistry portal, including what, a, what ADA has in this guide, a sample language of serving of, of the informed consent that you're going to need for giving these virtual services. That's one of the things that you're going to need to have with them. The other thing, though, that when, you're, when you have them in your office, you're not going to have them in the waiting room. You're not going to, you know, you're going to have them, they can sit in the car until they're ready, until they're, you're ready to have them come directly into your treatment room. And then we're going to do, probably want to do a pre-rinse. And this is where, after I'm done talking, Dr. Pooch has some really great news that he just had some information this morning. He'll talk later about an action that we have for pre-rinse. The other part is, is that once you see Dominic, you, you make the decision on what you're going to do, you can follow up with teledentistry. That's where there's an opportunity to have right now. Two, if you have access, and I really hope that you do have access to your database, that you could look up everybody that you saw in the previous two months before you stopped seeing patients. For anybody that you saw, whether it's in hygiene or you did some, uh, did some restorative operative dentistry on them, and you could do a virtual follow-up with them 
to check in on healing and how they're doing, et cetera, et cetera. You can also think of that forward of what you might want to triage in advance to when you get back to practice. That's why teledentistry can be used right now and you should be thinking about using right now, okay? Again, the coding, this coding billing guide, lots of pages to it, lots of information. Is be less enamored with what it tells you about what might be covered and stay with the important parts, which are the informed consent and some other things about teledentistry in general. So we certainly don't want to create droplets when, when Dominic's there. So Dominic's, Dominic's hurting, and we saw all the reasons why he could potentially be hurting. The thing is, is this is where the opportunity, and again, I want to thank Elevate as well as Dr. Jeremy Horst for his particular slide on that, is we want to come up with a triage product protocol for Dominic. Again, dealing with the emergency, the usual kind of trauma, swelling, bleeding. But then what about if we actually do some urgent care for those active caries infections? Now, this is another word that I'm very specific about. I talk about active caries infections versus a cavity. Fixing a cavity does not get rid of the active caries infection. That's the thinking that we need to do about how we can treat that. Silver diamine fluoride is certainly one of those treatments that we have. Silver diamine fluoride plus glass ionomer is called a SMART. When I'm talking about using SDF, I'm talking about using ART here, atraumatic restorative treatment, which basically with atraumatic restorative treatment, you're just taking a spoon excavator, you're taking the soft stuff out, and you're slapping the glass ionomer sealant on there. Now, I use that language in a couple of different ways purposely. First of all, it's scooping it out. And hygienists face it. We've been doing this for years. Oh, it's kind of scraping it. It's kind of soft and mushy. Okay, is it a reversible procedure? No. Is that tooth structure already gone? Yes. So why would we want to put a glass ion or a sealant over something like that? That's the basic basis of arch. Because with glass ion or sealant, it acts as a physical barrier against the, against the pathogenic pH acidic biofilm, you have a fluoride on there and it recharges, so we want to have them with some kind of fluoride at home. That's what we've had for a long time. And on my last slide I have that is art is officially endorsed by both the World Health Organization, which has kind of gotten a black eye lately, as well as the American Academy of, Pe of Pediatric Dentistry. Okay, that, this is not new. Where we have the opportunity though is to be smart. What's that? Will we use the silver diamond fluoride and the glass ionomer, that's called a smart restoration. A smart restoration. That's truly stabilizing that young person or any person. Or our seniors, people in nursing home situations or whatever, we need to get out there and do so much more of that. And that's, again, with teledentistry, the world really can change. When we're talking about using SDF, we know that this has a, an effect on the microbiome, which is what we want to do, and we want to arrest the caries infection. Okay? There's all kinds of courses and information out there on this. I'm not here to talk to you with SDF course, but I want to give you some information on coding. This is the code that was created a few years ago for treating with SDF. No, that's not a completely accurate. Codes are not for products. Product codes are for just the, um, the procedure. So the code was interim carriers arresting medicament application. That's what they passed the first year. This next year, the AAPD came back and they said this needs to be a per tooth code, and it is a per tooth code now. This is a therapeutic procedure, and that's the code you can use for the for the SDF part. What about the ART part? Here's two codes that you use for that. One is for a permanent tooth is protective restoration, and the second one is the interim therapeutic restoration for primary tooth. This, the, code, the uh, interim, the ITR, was added a few years ago in the CDT book. The protective restoration actually, if somebody knows anything about coding for a long time, that used to be a, a temporary filling code. And I even argued with Dr. Charles Blair, who I really admire and we are good friends, that I argued, he goes, that's a temporary filling code. I said, Charles, read the definition. Direct placement of restorative material to protect tooth and or tissue form. This procedure may be used to relieve pain, promote healing, and prevent further deterioration. That's exactly what we're doing. 
So if you do it smart, you use the you use the SDF code and you use the these interim the ITR or the ART codes that are there. They aren't really ART or ITR, those are my words for it. So those are how we can use this, but this is what we can do for Dominic to get him out of pain, to stop the disease process. Are we going to have to do a toothbrush lesson? You know, this whole thing of giving away toothbrushes, nobody ever thinks about how that we got in that habit. Well, I'm old enough and been around long enough that I know how we got in that habit. Back in 1971, when I was in dental hygiene school, there was the Preventive Dental Association around. Bob Barkley had a lot of names that we might have, some, many of us learned in a, maybe in a history lesson, but for me it was real. We had, they had the Preventive Dental Association. We used to do plaque control programs. That's where we had the patients come in week after week and teach them how to use a toothbrush. We were also trying to transitionalize them from a hard and medium bristle brush to a soft bristle brush. The idea is we would show them in the mouth, we would give them a toothbrush, and then they would take it home, and then they would know what to get when they go to the store. It went from a service, which I think that's, you know, giving away toothbrush is a fine service, we created it into a codependency. What do I mean by that? We take responsibility so they don't have to, because we know we have patients that only ever change their toothbrush when we give it to them. We have other patients that we've talked about using a power toothbrush, and we still hand them a manual toothbrush. And we hand them that string. And like me, I'll bet you there's some of you that know you have patients that could sell you that string, that the floss back at price, case price. What's the recipe for insanity? Doing the same things over and over thinking we're going to get a different outcome. Here's the thing about this whole oral hygiene thing. Are you using the codes for it? DO-1330 or hygiene instructions? If you aren't documenting it, we're losing a very, very important metric. And the oral hygiene instructions isn't for giving them the product, it's for the how to use the product. Again, which Carrie has taken into an art form. If it takes you more than the usual time when we multitask while we're doing something else, there is another code, Behavior Management by Report. Now this is a code that's much more like a medical code in that it's based on time. Okay, 15 minute increments. So if you spend it on 30 minutes, in which you might have to with Dominic and his mom, although I sure hope you aren't going to lecture Dominic's mom about flossing Dominic's teeth. Really? I think we have so many better options to offer Dominic's mom. We have case management codes for health, for motivation we're reviewing, for health, for oral health literacy. We have a code for special needs. If you have, say, an autistic child that takes more time or our adults, doesn't matter about age, but it's a code for special needs. Actually, in CDT Companion for 2021, there will be an entire chapter on special needs because it, my friend of mine that works in Arena is, it was asked to write that chapter. I'm really excited because she's the second hygienist that will actually ever work and have their, their work in the CDT book. Mine was the first. She's going to be the second. It's exciting times for dental hygiene and codes. The thing is, is why not send Dominic home with an entire treatment plan. See, that's what Carrie Free does. He needs a treatment rinse. He needs the he needs a nano hydroxy gel. He needs a whole bunch more than just a toothbrush. He needs teaching. He needs understanding, as does his mom, as does the other people that interact in his life. What they don't need is a lecture. They need to discover what's going on and how we can help them. And we can do that in having a way to follow up with them through teledentistry. Huge, huge. That's the bottom line on this. By the way, Carrie Free has a fantastic coding guide. The reason I know it's fantastic is I wrote it, but anyway, <laughs> that talks a lot about risk assessment and more, so talk to them about that. The thing is, is I'm really excited on another 2021 code. Dr. Peter Milgram, researcher out of Washington, Submitted this code himself, and what we're going to have in 2021 is a carries preventive meticament application code per arch. And as you can see, now I put the description in there or his rationale behind the code, and I put that in there because unfortunately that get, gets lost in the coding world, only the description and the name. And this is for the use of silver diamond fluoride, silver nitrate, chlorhexidine used as a medicament per arch. We don't have numbers for these. When a new code comes out, it takes a while for the, all of the other parts to be done. I'm just kind of giving you a little bit of a preview of where we're going and where our options are to help fulfill 
my three, my three things, a world with no oral cancer, a caries-free world, and to cure not just managed periodontal disease. It's time for us to reach higher. If all we think we're, if all we ever think we're going to do is manage, all we're going to do is manage. It's time to think of cure. It's time to think of health as the goal. Life is quickly, is dynamic and quickly changing. What happens when you're on a treadmill and you try to stop? You run your butt on the ground. Our world is dynamic and quickly changing. All of a sudden, everybody's listening and realizing it. The world is not stopping that because we're all at home. It's moving forward. How are you going to do it? The best way to change the future is to create it. I challenge you all to create it. Delta Ministries reached a tipping point. Malcolm Gladwell's book on the tipping point, you know, over which, you know, it's like the point of no return on an airline flight. I also wrote a book. We're using a whole lot of artificial intelligence. I wrote an article on artificial intelligence recently in teledentistry because when it comes to artificial intelligence, what, what, what AI can do is take massive amounts of data and give us patterns, give us understanding. And what I said in this, and artificial goes back to the future with the term we called GIGO, G-I-G-O. It's back in the early days of technology and computers, and that stood for garbage in, garbage out. We've got to code better. We've got the data in our records better because we can see patterns. We can understand things better, or at least the algorithms of artificial intelligence can. But we need to think through, what are we putting in? How are we doing it? What are we going to do with the future of teledentistry? It's time to disrupt. It wasn't like, you know, we've been very successful as a profession. Back on, I'll give you another historical point of view. Back on December 7, 1941, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, the military leaders needed to decide what it meant to be dentally fit to go to war. What did they know? Their military leaders. So they looked at the guidelines that were set in place in the, for the First World War, which is over 100 years ago now. And here's what the guide was, is that you had to have 12 functional teeth. That's all, just 12. Put your head around that. Only 12 teeth. Here's the thing how powerful and how far we've come as a society. By the end of 1943, they had to drop that parameter. Why? Because they could not find enough 18 to 21 year old young men that had 12 functional teeth. We've come a long way, but we haven't reached health. Have you had any patients with too much health? Because my husband and I have had a rough year, send some our way. There is no such thing as too, it's time to disrupt. We need to do something different if we want to get a different outcome. Teledentistry is the way. And I close my programs always with the wonderful poet laureate, Maya Angelou. You do the best you can so you know better. When you know better, you do better. You do better. You are exactly one hour and eight minutes older than when we started. Here's one thing I can guarantee you. You'll never get that hour and eight minutes back. So what are you going to do with what we talked about here today? So thank you. The futures are to create. Again, we create it by what we decide to do today. I want to thank, again, my friends at Carrie Freed, Dr. Cooch. And again, I'm here to help you navigate beyond oral health. Thank you so much, Patty. You are just absolutely the best. Um, you're such a dynamic speaker. There was so much great information in your presentation. Um, so sure enough, um, our attendees have a lot to think about and to go take action on. Um, one question. So we've had multiple people asking where they can get the link for the dental codes, where they can get your book. Um, they're wanting maybe some access to some of your slides to help with patient education, have some tools. Um, can sure. you give contact information or where people can reach out to you so they can get these resources? BeyondOralHealth.com. That's the easiest way to get me. Um, I'm more than happy to share all of my slides. There is a handout that, again, I, I sent in that gives you a link to a lot of the resources that I said. Again, you can, through Beyond Oral Health, that's where you can get a copy of the book. And again, like I said, I have a half price through the COVID crisis for everybody that really needs it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Cooch, so we alluded to earlier in the presentation, um, there's some exciting new research that has come out about using a pre-rinse in a sodium hypochlorite solution. So, Dr. Cooch, will you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I'd be happy to. We kind of got into this topic yesterday a little bit with Doug Young, for those of you who are with us. 
Um, and I had a question, a really good question this morning. I mean, I think we've all been using free rinses for surgical procedures and implants, and we've been doing that for as long as I can remember, uh, placing implants, and we kind of take that as a given that, you know, just using a free rinse. And back way back in the day, I was using chlorhexidine. And then, of course, when I started uh, working on just trying to treat the um, dental caries infection, so to speak, um, I found that chlorhexidine wasn't really providing the results I wanted. I, I moved to povidone iodine. That didn't work. Uh, and I finally settled on sodium hypochlorite, which is the um, antimicrobial agent that's in the carry-free treatment rinse. So I've been using that for like, I don't know, 18 years now, I think, in my practice. And a lot of that work went back to uh, Jorgen Slot's early published work on using sodium hypochlorite actually as an antibacterial rinse for self-care for treating periodontal disease and gingivitis. And so the question, so, you know, in my mind, I think we're all headed back to practice here in the next two months and hopefully, and the question becomes, well, can we protect ourselves better against this coronavirus if we use the pre-rinse? And um, so that question came up and I thought, yeah, I mean, I'm planning on using the treatment rinse on every patient and I want everybody in my practices doing that. Um, that just makes sense to me. And somebody asked me this morning, well, is there any scientific evidence on sodium hypochlorite and the coronavirus? And I thought, well, you know what? I haven't really looked at that. So I did. I went and did a, just a quick PubMed search this morning, and I found four articles that have been published in the last month on disinfectants and the coronavirus, this coronavirus specifically. And uh, of those, I'm just going to go through these real quickly, but one article was on hand washing and using different disinfectants on hand washing in the coronavirus. And uh, they found that 1% uh, solution of soap inactivated 98%, uh, a 0.5% solution of chlorine uh, reduced at 96%, and catch this, a 0.25% solution of sodium hypochlorite eliminated 99.98% of the coronaviruses. It was the best and the most effective thing. Uh, the carry free treatment rinse is a 0.2% solution of sodium hypochlorite. Uh, in another study looking at uh, other coronaviruses and SARS and, and MERS, uh, a 0.1% of sodium hypochlorite uh, inactivated those viruses in less than a minute. And then there was a study done on surfaces, a nine-day surface study, uh, and found that the three best ways to inactivate it were a 60 to 70% ethanol solution, a 0.5% hydrogen peroxide, or again, a 0.1% sodium hypochlorite solution and it inactivated the virus within in less than a minute. Uh, the other nice thing about sodium hypochlorite, if you go back to the Dakin solution, which is a 0.4%, uh, your neutrophils in your body, this is how your body protects itself. It actually, your body produces the hypochlorous ion. And I know Brad Bales, we talked about that on our very first webinar here in this series. Uh, your body produces and your neutrophils produce um, the hypochlorous ion. And, the, and so the Dakin solution in studies was found that it um, inactivated, it was a great uh, antimicrobial agent, which is, again, a, a sodium hypochlorite solution, <laughs> but that it also didn't destroy any tissue or, or did not damage cells, living cells. So um, that was, and it, and it didn't get overwhelmed when it was in blood serum as well. So, you know, it, in terms of have there been any specific studies on a mouth rinse and the coronavirus, no, and there probably aren't going to be for a long time. But based on the scientific evidence we have, um, the sodium hypochlorite as a disinfectant and as a, certainly would be my go-to choice as a pre-rinse, and that the best of our scientific evidence today would support that. So I just wanted to share that with everybody. I want you to be safe. When you go back to practice, I want you to take all of your PPE measures and be as safe as you can for you and your team and your patients. But uh, think about using a uh, using the carry-free treatment rinse as a pre-rinse for every patient. Um, so that's, that kind of gives you, in a, in a nutshell, gives, brings you up to speed on what we know as of today. Again, those papers have all been published in March of this year. So uh, pretty exciting news, actually. So, Patty, I want to thank you. I, I Listening to you today, I, I'm reminded 
of a quote that John Coyce uses all the time, and he loves to say that all of us are smarter than one of us. And I tell okay. you, just seeing, seeing all of the minds that we're working together trying to come up with solutions, uh, both in our ever-changing world and being able to work together and integrate all this, it, it's, such a, it, it's such a wonderful experience, and it's such, um, I would say, the most gratifying part of years of my career are right now. And I've been around as long as you have. <laughs> uh, so uh, I would say the, the, today is the best ever, right? And we've got some new, really unique and huge challenges, but we've got the best minds of, any, of all the group of people that I've ever known that are working on it together. So, Patty, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much. I'm honored. Like I said, this is it is amazing the number of people. And I always I always like the idea of synergy that one plus one equals five. I like that idea. And I don't like math much, so I really like that idea. And yeah, we have such yeah. synergy between all of us. It's excellent. Yep. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. So thank much. you so much, everyone. Um, a couple of other things to address. Um, we've had some questions about the articles uh, that, that Dr. Cooch just talked about. We will post them with this recording. Um, we're also going to be putting out another recording where Dr. Cooch will walk through the full process and the science behind it. So you will have access to that. It will be coming out. Um, and then we are talking about getting him on a live session as part of our Connect conference. Um, so we will be working on that as well. Um, one other thing that I wanted to let you guys know we will post with this course, Patty has been so gracious to work with us and create a carry free and carries risk assessment coding guide. Um, so we have that and we will post it with her course. We will also post her Beyond Oral Health information in a handout form so that when you guys come back to this recording or if you share this recording, all of that information will be together. And you can pull it all, download it, and feel free to, to share it with the recording. Um, Facebook, please join our group if you haven't already. We've got about 300 members on our Facebook group, so it's a great place to continue networking with everyone uh, that's been involved with Connect. Um, we're posting recordings in there. We'll also be emailing them each day, again, with the CE information, so you'll get that today. Um, feel free to reach out to Patty directly if you want to you know, discuss anything specifically that you heard on today's webinar that you would like to implement in your practice. Um, and then tomorrow, I want you guys don't miss tomorrow's course. We're going to have hygienist Michelle Hudson. She's going to be talking about oral pathogens and their key role in heart health. Um, plus, she's just a really awesome human, another one that we have joining us on this conference. So um, I think you will really enjoy her presentation. So again, thank you to all of our attendees today. Thank you, Patty, for being such a champion for us and for the dental community. Um, and thank you, Dr. Cooch. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Bye, everybody. See you tomorrow. Bye. Bye.